<laughs> hey everyone, I just want to welcome you here to Piccolo Farm. My name is Lizzie and um, I always start my workshops just acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands, the Dharawal people, because we are in Dharawal country now. And um, I really acknowledge their custodianship and their, um, I guess, all of the elders, past persons and emerging. Um, this, what we've got to talk to you about today is how we raise chickens and quails. If you can see behind me, I'm standing out in my paddock. So we're just up in Thirlmere at the moment. We've got, just to give you a bit of an idea of everything that you can't see, we've got a four acre farm here and we have a big market garden around these chickens. Some of the rows that the chickens are on are actually part of the to be market garden that we're just preparing. And I'm not sure how much you're able to see of them, but I'm hoping that you're able to see them dust baiting on the ground. So they're really happy chickens. <laughs> what I'll be talking about today is how we raise chicken and quail, but I, um, I just want to give a bit of a disclaimer is that there's a lot of different ways that this can be done. We obviously have a lot of space in the way that we operate and we choose to move our chickens around in electric netting so that we can continue to give them fresh pasture. Now, a lot of the things that we do here, you can still transfer and use in a situation where um, you have a set run for the chickens, or if you just have a small space and you want to move them about. We're also going to cover some of the differences between quail and chickens, and in what situation you'll be able to set up the quail, and in other situations where you'll be able to set up the chickens and differences between those two. Um, I just want to just tell you off the top of my head just and just let you know that if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to just put a comment in the bottom of the Facebook feed and um, some of my assistants here will nudge me and just ask me the questions so that I'll be able to give you the answer straight away. Now, one of the most important things that people ask most questions about is housing um, because that's essentially the first step. How do I set up before I get the chicken? So I want to take you through our setup and just give you some pointers. Now we've had quite a few, what's called a chicken trailer, whereas a chicken house that's on wheels or that you can move. We operate the same way with our quail in the sense that we have had them in portable scenarios, portable trailers that we can move gradually. We do that just because we have a lot of space and providing them with new fresh pasture all the time is what we consider the best scenario for us. If you aren't unable, if you're not able to set up in the set, same set, you know, same setting and the same space that we are, you can still utilize some of the hints and tips and things that we're doing on a smaller scale. So let's check it out. So the first thing that you might be able to see is that we have this electric netting and this is just something that we step around. So we're able to move that and just like step it into the paddock when we're moving it to a new pasture. This is not so much to keep the chickens in because they will easily escape this if they want to. It's more just keeping the foxes out. So we are, we don't have a lot of foxes in the daytime, unfortunately, but um, we do have them at night time. So we want to make sure that we have this defense for them. Um, the next step of defense with our housing, which is really important, is that we make sure that it is really um, well protected and it's really sturdy so that any foxes are unable to get in. This is the back door. We only use it for when we need to clean it out. But as you can see, this construction is quite comprehensive. You don't necessarily have to use this gauge, but when we bought this trailer and upgraded it to a chicken trailer, this was the doors that were already on there and they're obviously sturdy enough. Um, what we do is that we actually put, we raise the trailer off the ground. So you can probably see a lot of the chickens are underneath. Thus provide them with um, some shelter from the sun. When it comes out into the summertime as well, we will provide them with additional shade because it's really important with the house requirements just to consider that they do need, they get really hot. And on really hot days, if you don't have sufficient shelter from the sun and the heat, your chickens can actually die. 
Um, another thing with the chicken trailer, as you can see, it's set up on these, these wheel arches. We're actually able to just move these by hand. Um, just actually just dragging them along the paddocks to give them nice press pasture. Being able to do so helps the pasture because we're not getting like a really big heavy load of chicken manure in one spot. But you're also moving away from any pathogens or, you know, worms and other diseases that might be in the chicken's poo. So you give them a nice clean pasture to live on. This is a little bit next level, I would say, from being a backyard chicken keeper, but it is worth every cent. <laughs> Having an automated chicken door that will allow the chickens to go out straight away early in the morning is a really nice way um, to be able to keep your chickens safe, but also make sure that you're never going to forget to lock them up and open it up. So you can set this to be on a time basis, or you can set it on the solo. And it will... That's a rooster just acknowledging over here. <laughs> so you can set this um, so that at the crack of dawn it will open up and that's where you girls and the rooster really wants to come out um because this chicken trailer isn't huge it's almost like having a small bedroom in terms of how many chickens are in there we do want them to be able to go out the moment that they wake up so that they can have a little bit more space stretch the legs and go out and start scratching and getting on with their day <laughs> what we also choose to have here is um we have a dual water setup and they're both automated. Um, we set it up in a sense that we have a little water tank here and the hose <coughs> that goes down to a nipple drinker, which is just simply a, a piece of hose with some nipples that are sitting down and the chickens will peck these to get the water. This is a really, <coughs> this is a really easy way to keep make sure that the chicken's water is clean at all times. Because if you have dirty water, it's something that can really, um, yeah, it can really do a lot for chicken's diseases and illnesses and that sort of thing. So you want to make sure that they always have water and that it's always nice and fresh water. In the summertime, you can put a big block of ice. <laughs> you put a big block of ice in this to keep the water colder. If water is hot, chickens will not drink it. Um, the other water that we also have, and by all means, you can have, I'll show you a little a simpler water drinker as well, just the ones that you get at the feed stores. And they are, there's nothing wrong with them at all. It's just that they don't have the longevity. And um, at least the plastic ones don't tend to have the longevity. And also you do need to clean them out quite often. So this is just a very low maintenance system that we have devised. This is connected to mains and the reason why we have the tub in there is because we have an old tub in there that allows the pressure to come down to put an The other system that we have also is just one of these trucks. And you can attach to that if you want to raise it off the ground just to make sure that it's not too high so that you think it's going to keep it. But uh, obviously, a setup like this, you will, you will have to make sure that you clean that out on a regular basis. Um, it's really good to have both on hot days, I found, because if you can drink this sometimes, it just might not be enough to entice the chicken to drink enough, but it's crucial for them. So we put that one in underneath just to make sure that it's in the shade. And then we also put some ice blocks in there. So it's just kind of like trying to work out the best solutions to make sure that the chickens stay healthy. Now I have so much information for you today, so I'm going to just make sure that I've covered everything by my little general notes. Um, some of the things I've spoken about the predators in regards to um, the, uh, the foxes coming through, but you will also find that if you have really young chickens or silkies, for example, you might need to provide them with additional um, pest protection from things like eagles or goshawks and that sort of thing because they are known to take take birds and if you've got quail uh, just to jump a little bit sideways in regards to quail they actually need to have an enclosed run um, or quite high sides because they are able to fly to about two meters high especially if they're startled they will just take off straight up 
they don't have very good aim, unfortunately. Um, so it's better to make sure that that ceiling is not too far down because they can actually just shoot straight up over the ceiling. So make sure that it's at least um, 1.5 meter away, whether it's a permanent run or if it's a, you know something that you can move, you still want to have a bit of height to that. And that will also protect them because they are quite small birds. We did have a boss that used to come and sit on the quail tractor on a regular basis to try and, you know, check them out and see if we can manage to, to get one out of there. We never managed, I'm happy to say, but it is something you need to consider as well. So we want extra protection to make sure that we've got this kind of predators in our access. This mesh that you've seen here, if I only had this as a protection and the chickens were going to, this is the only chicken, also the only fox proofing that I had, I would actually end up putting a finer mesh on here. Because what you find is the chickens are not the smartest um, and also very curious. And the same with quail. And they would actually end up sticking their heads through to check out what's going on if a fox comes to visit. and. Unfortunately, that um, might sometimes lead to their demise. So just make sure that you put finer meshing on there. Um, otherwise, what you're looking for is just something that protects them from the elements. So wind, you know, um, rain, sunshine, it's pretty much the same requirements that we have. They are fairly durable, but you need to put them in a situation where they can be nice and healthy and keep themselves safe. Um, they really want a dust bath as well. So if you don't have access to the paddock like we have here and there's an open area where they're dust bathing, that just really keeps them their feathers nice and fresh, um, keeps any mites out and, you know, that sort of thing. If you have a run, a chicken run or a permanent run where there isn't enough space for you to have that, you might just want to put together a little box. And in that box, you want to fill that up. You can fill it with a combination of, you know, dirt and sand, but it's also really good to put things like um, diatomaceous earth and also ash. I mean, the ash can color your birds a bit, so it depends on what you want them to look like, but, um, but it's just a really good way for them to condition themselves and just to protect their body and protect their feathers. You know, we take showers all the time and this is their way of doing that. We also provide them with, um, So just in terms of different types of feed. Um, now I'm going into this because I'm talking about the different things that you need to have to setting up. Now in our setting, there's a lot of bugs and things that they can pick up. Um, if you have a free range layer feed, it, is, it does have a lot of things that your chicken will need, but with the emphasis of them being free range and the assumption there is that they're going to have access to bugs and things that they can collect out of the grass. And they also eat the grass as well and the greens. My preference is to give them the pellets only because this is more like this food will provide them with everything they need and they can't pick and choose. Now, some people prefer the scratch mix where you have both seeds. And by all means, that's that's also a really good alternative as long as you make sure that you get a good brand that has enough protein in it. Um, we just find that sometimes the chickens will choose to pick out all the goodies and they won't go for the stuff that they need. It's a little bit like, you know, this way we're telling the kids to eat the greens within the rest of the feed, if that makes sense. With the quails, it's a different story altogether. I know a lot of people are under the perception that quail can just eat um, the aviary scratches and just the seeds that fall down from the canaries or what have you in the aviary on the bottom of the aviary. Traditionally, a lot of people do use them as a cleanup bird, um, but that just does not have enough protein for them. If you don't give them a good quality feed and Sometimes people will just batch feed them and give them a little bit of feed and make sure that they eat it all and then take the feed away or maybe do it twice a day or something like that. It is an alternative. We just think that providing food and have it available for them all day around and particularly the quail because they really do have quite a high nutritionist requirement. 
I prefer for the older quails to have say 24, 26 protein levels. So it's not just a case of buying them any type of feed. You need to give them something that has all their requirements because they just can't go out and choose from, I guess, the the menu, the forest, or just go forage whatever they want if they're in a situation where they only have a limited space. So the food is very important. Um, you can also give them shell grits. So shell grit, if you don't have a space where they can do a lot of scratching and pick up those things on the go, the shell grit's really important to be able for them to digest the food and to get additional nutri nutrients in certain situations as well, depending on if it's shell grit that could actually add them calcium um, or shell grit just so that they can keep it in the gizzard to actually break down the food. Um, for the... And I mean, this is just our personal opinion and not by any means what you have to do. But our preference for game bird feed for the quail is the Lauki mix. We found it to be really good quality. And if you get the show bird or the um, layer pellets, the layer crumble, that just seems to be a very good whole way of, food, of feeding them in terms of the, the base requirement. Now, I'm not sure if you can see over here. <laughs> Because we have a garden, um, we're able to supplement their feed with a lot of additional food. By all means, um, sift through your composting stuff that you have from your kitchen and give them everything um, that you would normally put in the compost. You have to make sure that it doesn't have avocado in there though, because it is toxic to the birds. And um, I just have a list here, like caffeine, chocolate, grapeseed, rhubarb and tomato leaves is something that is toxic there's a few other things as well but just consider if it's something that you would be able to eat um essentially most of the time it's something that the chickens will be able to eat so we just we crack in things like greens and that sort of thing sometimes they'll eat them straight away they take a bit of a nibble giving them fresh green pasture all the time is also a really good way and you will find that the more leafy greens um, especially the dark green stuff the better and the darker will the yolks will be this is also i'll show you a treadle feeder and um, this is a really good way of keeping other pests out. So other birds that might otherwise come and eat your chicken feed. And also this is rat proof. So the rats can't come and open this. The chickens will just step on that feeder and be able to access that food. And this way it's not going to get wet either because you always have to make sure that that stays dry. Now... I want to go on to talking about everyday maintenance, but one of my favorite ways actually of doing chicken feed when I don't do just the regular dry pellets is fermenting chicken feed. It's amazing and it has a lot of the benefits that we get from fermented foods. And it's literally as simple as just taking either the grains or the pellets, putting them into a bucket, preferably with fresh, clean rainwater. Otherwise, tap water works as well. Um, and just make sure in that bucket you've got, you know, about two inches of water above. You stir that for about three days straight, a couple of times a day. And on the third day, you will have like a really kind of bit of a sour, but it shouldn't taste, like it shouldn't smell off. I don't normally taste it. <laughs> it shouldn't smell off. It should just kind of have that like bit of a sour fermenting smell. And that's where you actually feed it to your chickens. And it's more like a slurry at that point because it has softened. But it does do a lot for the nutrients that they're able to take up. Um, the daily maintenance of what we normally do, and it's funny because we will also now have a look at um, where we go to check out if we have any eggs. Um, we have rolling or roll away nesting boxes, which means that the eggs roll away from the chickens. So they will get in here and they will lay the egg and then it will roll into this space here where we'll pick them up. So we have a few different types of birds. So you can see that there are different types of eggs. Now, quail will not go into a nesting box and they will not roost. So the requirements, like we have roosting space in there, which is basically just some sticks that the chickens sleep on. 
quails will not have a dedicated space where they put their eggs, so they will just lay the eggs in on the ground. So you just need to keep an eye out and make sure they collect them on a regular basis um, so that you don't miss any and they will go bad. Um, but these ones are really good because they will roll away, they'll be out of the sun. Um, also, the chickens aren't very likely to eat them, which they can do sometimes. Particularly, it tends to be a habit, but it can also be a situation where the chickens are doing it because their feed is not high enough in protein. But the good thing about not having the eggs out is because they don't tend to go broody. But when I say tend to, that's a relative thing because I have two girls that are just sitting. They've been sitting. <laughs> Don't mess with broody chickens, I'll tell you that one. So this girl, she's been sitting there for about two weeks on nothing, just being broody. And broody means that they want to have chickens. You can see now she pecked me, but look, didn't do much. It's no drama. Um, I have another one sitting on the bottom. She's also been sitting, trying to hatch out these imaginary eggs for about two weeks. And because it's a role when nesting while she's not sitting on anything. There are methods of trying to break that behavior, but we tend to just let them have their go. As long as we know that they're eating and drinking and they are getting off, sometimes we will take them off, but just make sure that we put them down to make sure that they eat and drink. But in general, uh, because we have so many birds as well, we do get enough eggs. They tend to a lot of time go off the lay, which means they stop laying in the time that they're, sitting on eggs whether real or not um, what we sometimes do as well is that we simply put day old hatchlings underneath a broody hen and that way she thinks she's hatched out those chickens herself um, you have to do it at night time though because they're not they're not going to believe you unless it's happened during the night <laughs> now the everyday maintenance that I do, so I will obviously check for eggs and I will gather all the eggs. Um, I will make sure that they are getting the water and that it's fresh. It might need a bit of a cleaning out. Um, I'll also make sure that they have enough feed and that's fresh. You know, those feeders that are sitting outside, if the water gets into those feeders, it can clog up the feeder and they are not actually able to access the remainder of the feed that can also make the feed moldy, which isn't ideal for the chickens. So you really need to make sure that it's fresh and dry. Um, you also just want to kind of check out the chickens. And I mean, they're all hiding in the shade right now. Um, <laughs> not really wanting to come out and say hi, but essentially you want to monitor them just to see, are they moving the way they should be? Are they happy? Are they healthy? Are they doing their thing? Or are they withdrawing? or lethargic, you know, just kind of like get to know them. If they don't seem like they're active, you just want to consider if there's something going on with them. You know, they might not be healthy right now and it might be something that you have to do something about. Uh, I mean, the first thing to do would just be to gather that chicken and check it over. If you find that it's really hard to get to the chicken, it won't stop for you to be able to grab it. These chickens are very placid, so you can generally just go and pick them up. But that's not always the case, and especially not if you have a rooster in the flock. He might not like for you to pick up the chickens. Um, so you might want to go and do it at night time. So what you want to do then is just wait until it's dark and the chicken's gone to bed, and you then go and check out the bird in question and just give her a once-over and seeing, you know, has she lost weight? Is she, you know, does she have mites, which is a very common thing. You can also check when they poo, if there's any worms. Um, essentially, a runny poo is not good. So you might have to treat them for worms. Um, again, moving the chickens on a regular basis will help you. Even if you only have a small space and a small run, you might want to divide them into a few different sections because just taking the chickens from one space to the next means that any potential worms, any potential mites is actually going to be reduced by you moving them. We choose to have all our chicken house made from metal from the simple reason that metal is really easy to clean and you won't actually find a lot of mites and a lot of um, things actually staying in that space. You could just post them out. 
you can also use diatomaceous earth to treat mites on chickens. With the worms, you can add things to their feed in the water like um, chili and garlic, but that's only if it's kind of like, it's more of a preventative thing. So you could put apple cider vinegar to give them a bit of a conditioner in the water. You can just put chili straight into their feed, and especially if you're fermenting it. They don't taste the chili. They don't have the heat receptors for the chili, so you don't have to be too concerned about overwhelming them. But it is a way to try and clear out the system. If they're already getting lethargic, though, it's kind of like an early prevention. If they're already getting lethargic and you think it's because of worms, you might need to actually treat them. We just have a question, Lizzie. Yeah. Um, Tammy's asked, how do I stop my chickens going into the dog yard? Well, there's a lot of questions that I would ask about the setup that Tammy already has. Um, obviously, fencing is is the best way to keep chickens in. Um, like I said, even if I clip the wings on my chickens, and for those who are not familiar with the process, when you're clipping the chickens' wings, you're actually just clipping a few of the feathers. So you're not yanking out the feathers, you're not actually clipping out the arms. You're actually just taking a few of the feathers on one side of the chicken, the flight feathers that are actually in here. You can gently cut those off, making sure they stay clear of the actual bird arm. It won't hurt them. But when they try to then fly, um, which is the way that I presume that they might be getting over your fence into the chicken run, they will be um, off canter and they won't be able to fly in the same way. Mind you, even if even if they wanted to, a chicken who has been, um, where the feathers been cut might be able to get over something like this. So it really needs to be higher. Um, you might also want to consider why the chickens want to go into the dog run. Is it because there's more shade? Are they getting the food? Are they getting the water? Is it something that you can remove that is actually attracting them into that space? Um, that's the first things that I would check and you know, hopefully that gives you the answer. Now I'm going to touch a little bit on to dynamics when it comes to a flock. It's particularly important for quail because quail are extremely territorial. So if you have quail, and by the way, quail are fantastic for a small backyard and they give these really cute little spotted eggs. Um, and it tastes just like chicken eggs. They're just about a third or a quarter, depending on the size of your chicken eggs, um, of, the, of the chicken egg. Um, I call them lunchbox size eggs because <laughs> they tend to work really well and be popular with kids. Um, you can also tell on the spots of the eggs which hen it is that are lighted. They kind of have their like signature spots that are recurring on the eggs. Um, but if you have a smaller space, that's a really good, um, because they're smaller birds, you can really get away with doing that. And you can also have a rooster in that space, even if you are close to your neighbors, which it's not ideal with a very noisy rooster if you're not in a rural area, even if you're rural, but close to your neighbors and they're not happy with the rooster. Having a quail rooster will get you past that pro you know, problem because they don't crow as loudly as the other birds do, as the chickens do. But when you're introducing new birds to the flock, first of all, you want to make sure that they're healthy so you're not bringing in any diseases. But also you want to try and keep them. I do the same with the chickens and the quail. You want to try and keep them side by side in a situation where they can't touch, but they can actually see each other for at least about two weeks. And then you can remove that space and they can actually come together. However, I would never have more than one um, rooster, a quail rooster in one of my batches, unless I have ample space and a lot of places for the other rooster to hide because they can get very vicious and they tend to go for the other, for the other rooster. Um, chicken roosters are a little bit more forgiving, um, but you will also find that if you not if you don't have enough females, you really want to have four to five females for a rooster as well when it comes to quail. Whereas with the chickens, we just keep one rooster in a batch, really. We find that that's quite sufficient. We don't get any fighting. It just tends to be a nice, harmonious way of keeping the chickens. And with an unlimited number of girls, because we don't we're not too concerned about fertility in terms of trying to incubate eggs, etc. Whereas 
um, with a quail, yeah, a minimum minimum four to five girls because they will latch onto the girls on the back of the neck and they will stand on their backs when they're mating. And they just tend to cause a lot of damage. So if you do have, if you don't have enough girls, for those of you who don't know what quail look like, I'm going to show you a quail now. They're really beautiful little bird and really super duper placid, at least to people. <laughs> like I said, it can be very territorial when it comes to each other, if you're introducing new, certainly give them a lot of space and a lot of chance to get away and you won't have any dramas. If you find within the first couple of days that they are aggressive towards each other, you really want to try and separate them again. Now, this is one of the quails here. As you can see, it's a really lovely little bird and I'm holding in a way that it's going to be nice and calm and feel like it's supported. It's the same thing when you're picking up chickens, you have to make sure that you're confident and you're picking them up in a way that they're comfortable so that they don't feel like they're going to fall. You listening to me? Yeah. They're really curious, these little birds, just like chickens and super lovely to have around. They're really good alternative for kids as well. So like I said, they can fly, but generally don't, won't do it unless they feel like they're forced to. With the girls compared to the boys, in general, the different colorings will be an indication as to if they're male or female. Um, this is actually one of Ibrahim's, I would say girls, because it has a spotted chest. The giveaway tend to be, if it has a spotted chest, it's a girl. If it has a clear chest, it's a male. Obviously, if you have one of the white birds, that won't be the case. This is a Coturnix or a Japanese quail. And they're one of the larger varieties. There's some 130 varieties available um in regards to the different types of quail that we have i'm going to hand her over now and just have a quick look okay. i've spoken a lot about the way that you can keep the um the birds healthy but i just want to let you know that if you do find that you do have a sick bird um maybe it's been um, you know, a fox is bitten or anything like that. If it needs, you can take it to the vet where a lot of the time you can put, um, not disinfectant, um, betadine, the wound cleaner on a, on a wound and then make sure that that bird is separated from the rest of the flock. You need to put them in a nice, comfortable environment that's, you know, dry and where they have fresh water and food and where they're not going to get too stressed out. And it's really the case of any type of sick birds. You might need to remove them for the flock. Just make sure that it is necessary because removing them for the flock can also be stressful. Now, I'm not sure. The final thing that I just want to tell you or show you is that there's a few different types of birds that we have on the property. Um, might step around this side. You can see the nice big white hen that we have here. She is a what's traditionally considered a meat bird. She's a type of cob and uh, we bred her out to see if we can have a cross with our rooster to get um, a healthier bird just because these are a little bit too big. We really want to see if we can get something that's a little bit medium size. The Plymouth Rocks, which is a dual purpose bird. Um, it's more of a homesteading preferred alternative. They're really placid and live for a long time. And then we have our Isa Brown as well, which are also really nice and placid birds and are really lovely. They are really good egg layers, um, but they don't tend to live for as long as the Plymouth Rocks do. Just to give you a bit of a difference between the birds that we have. All right, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. If you do have any questions, Feel free to pop them in the Facebook feed and I'll try to get back to some of them later on. And um, I hope you've enjoyed seeing the chickens that we have here.